listening to Shoot It Now, your weekly podcast about indie filmmaking and big budget films with award winning filmmaker Craig Newland. And welcome to another Shoot It Now podcast. My guest has directed and written several films, including The Joneses, London Town, American Dreamer, and his latest film starring Russell Crowe called Unhinged. Derek Bort, welcome to Shoot It Now. Uh, Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And your brother Jason was a pro surfer and the author of the Pipe Dreams, the Kelly Slater biography. So writing clearly runs in the family. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think my brother's a much better writer than I am and much better surfer than I am as well. Has he worked with you on any of your films? Uh, no, I mean, I, I sometimes show him a script just to get some feedback, but I think, you know, it's such a different medium in terms of screenplay format versus manuscript, you know, that he usually works in for nonfiction. But, you know, I, we definitely, you know, bounce ideas off each other. And I, I helped him when he published, uh, the kook's guide to surfing with, you know, notes on that as well as finding him an illustrator and things like that. So we get to, you know, try to work together a little bit, but nothing, nothing serious on the feature side at all yet. And I want to go back just a little bit, too, because you've got some association with Billabong, Gotcha, and Rip Curl. So let's go back, because you did some graphic design work for these surf companies. But prior to that, uh, you did an art degree. Was that right? Yeah, I studied painting and some multimedia art all through high school and college. I I kind of paid my way by doing anything from t-shirts to other graphic design for a lot of the surf companies. It would pay my way to to take surf trips whenever I needed to. And, you know, it was a lot of fun, but it it was um, very confining when you're, you know, just doing a specific assigned drawing or graphic piece for a t-shirt. It wasn't really fulfilling to me, but, but it worked very well as a teenager to pay the bills. And how did you segue from the the art side of things getting involved in the film industry? How did that happen for you? Well, I'd always been a film fanatic, you know, and, and spent a lot of time at the movie theater. I don't think I ever really kind of realized that it was just like something that you could do. I know that may sound strange. I never realized that there was a person who kind of got to write and direct a movie and and then in college, I started going to this art house theater. And I think the first film I saw there was Wings of Desire. And I was just hooked with indie film. And I would go see every single film that they would bring in. And that's when I realized that this is something that you can have an idea and you can write it and you can make a film. And, you know, at that point, you know, I knew it was possible. I didn't really know how to do it or how to how to get into it. And um I got a call from a friend one day who was working in production and said that the production designer had had walked off the job or something and they needed someone to replace him or her. And he told them that that he had a friend. I went down and worked on in the art department on this production. And my, that was my first experience uh, on set and was just hooked immediately and just the energy and the really everything about it. I knew that's where I wanted to be. So at that point, it was just kind of learn everything I can about every aspect of it and in hopes of of one day getting to make my own films. This is the early days of nonlinear editing. They had a great tutorial on, on the Avid. So I taught myself how to, you know, how to edit and just, you know, worked doing everything from pulling cables to, you know, just working as a PA and, and kind of learned my way through the business that way until I got to got to finally make my own movie years later. Isn't it so seductive, though, that very first experience on the set? <laughs> you know, it's just... Oh, yeah. <laughs> it, 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 yeah. It's, it just takes over someone's brain. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think the seeing a large group of people all kind of working towards one goal, that really hooked me, you know, just seeing how everyone had their job. And, you know, this particular thing was a music it was a Neil Diamond TV special, actually, that I worked on. And it just showed me kind of, I guess, what every day could be like. And, and you could actually get paid to do this. It was a job, and yet it was so much fun. And your film, London Town, The Clash, 1970s, what a, a great era. A story centered around a 14-year-old boy who was introduced to the band, which changes his life forever. Music films are always really hard to pull off. But earlier in your career, you worked at Sony Music Studios, then working in film and videos 
on MTV Unplugged. And I wonder just how much of all of that helped with making London Town for you. Wow, you've done your homework. <laughs> That's good. That's awesome. You know, having worked on on quite a few music videos absolutely helped. I mean, I think that this project, London Town, was a passion project for me. I mean, I, I had just come off the Joneses and I, I was kind of turning down every film that was coming my way. And my agent at the time said, what's your dream project? And I said, literally without even thinking about it, I'd love to do something about a kid discovering The Clash because, you know, I had always thought they really weren't the kind of band for a biopic because you know their story wasn't really that interesting it was the more it was more the effect the music had on people and what they were saying that was far more interesting and i i was that kid you know albeit in a different part of the world and so my agent says uh guess what i i another client got offered this film and and it's exactly what you're looking for you know, next thing you know, we're, we're making this film. So then comes the, the concept of, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to shoot these actors pretending to be The Clash, my all-time mm -hmm. favorite band. And there's a little bit of pressure that comes with that. You know, uh, how do we make it feel right for, and authentic? And, and thankfully, uh, you know, we had some great people in London that were able to record Johnny Reese Myers and the, and the guys, the other actors actually performing these songs. You know, we were able to avoid the whole lip sync thing, which was a big deal to me and long winded way to answer your question. But going back full circle to all the music videos I had worked on or been around. You want to shoot a performance in a way I wanted it to feel gritty and in the moment and, and authentic and actually just the opposite of what most music videos were doing at the time, which was much more uh, glossy kind of um, theatrical slick. kind of. Yeah, slick. Exactly. You know, so really it was just about me and the guys in the crowd with some cameras and trying to capture what it would have been like to see The Clash at that point in time in, in the small venues they were playing. I think this was like the Hackney Working Man's Club. You know, we wanted to have that feeling of just some little, some spot that somehow they, they were able to book a show in and all the punks from everywhere showed up. I think with that part, we did a good job on the film in terms of just, I felt happy with the way that part of it was portrayed. And thankfully, when we premiered at the London Film Festival, the feedback from a lot of people that were part of, of The Clash's world, part of their circle years earlier, really went out of their way to, to, to say how much they loved the performances and the music in the film. And, and, and really, is, you know, on top of that, the response to the film itself, that here in the States, I think people had a, a more of a romanticized notion about The Clash being maybe more punk than they really were. They were very political. They were obviously, they were punk, but they were, you know, the people in Joe's circle knew him, you know, as a guardian angel and a generous person. He wasn't the kind of punk that you would like when you think of like Sid, Sid and Nancy or something like that. You know, I think that his people, once you were in his circle, he would give you all the money in his pocket and he would do things, you know, for his friends. And a lot of them went out of their way to tell me that. And that was really great, you know, to get that response from people that actually were part of his world in the late 70s and London. London, you know, and the subject matter was just special to me. And as filmmakers, we're always looking to change things up a little bit with every new project, change up to a different genre, different characters, a different tone and style. Looking at your different films, you've certainly managed to achieve that. Is that a conscious decision? I'm sort of genre agnostic. It starts on the page for me. And if it's, uh, if it's a script that I respond to, it could be really just has always been kind of what have I read that I can't get out of my head and that I feel like I have to make. For instance, with Unhinged, you know, much bigger action sequences and a different scope and scale than I had done before. And that film had that to offer, among other things. It's whatever speaks to me at the time. I'm reading two scripts a day most of the time, and I just try to be open-minded to the material and whatever reaches off the page and grabs me kind of is what it is. And here's a question, uh, particularly all of our indie filmmakers listening to this podcast. A lot of first-time directors don't give it a second thought of having a name in their first feature. But The Joneses, your first film back in 2008, you had both Demi Moore and David Duchovny. How did that all fall into place for you in terms of dreaming of that cast for your first film? 
that was a film that needed to be slick. You know, it, it was about the products. It was about the, the that world of conspicuous consumption. So I knew that I needed a budget that would afford me the things, uh, not only on camera, you know, in terms of the production that would give it that slick look. I met with David first and we just connected and, you know, he really got the material, he got the character and he really wanted the role. And at the time, the financiers, they didn't really feel like David was the person they wanted from a business standpoint. And I just, you know, kind of letting the process play itself out. And they, they steered me to, you know, a few other people over the next six or seven months. I didn't really feel with any of them, you know, the same kind of connection I felt with David and David's connection to the material. And, you know, I kept telling him, I, I think David's the right one for the for the role. I think he's really right. And so then when, you know, Demi was interested and I met with her a few times and really was excited to be able to work with her. And I think she really got the material as well. And it seemed like a good fit. She still had, you know, I guess, let's say that kind of foreign value that that financiers look for. And to have the two of them in this cast was huge for the movie. So the sheer amount of time spent on set between the two of them was something that I knew I was going to learn a lot from that. And, and, you know, I knew that while it might be challenging, you know, that's the point of all this is to, is to grow and, and know that the process to me is just as important as the end result. It was really wonderful to have the two of them in my first feature. And in 2019, you co-wrote and directed American Dreamer, a thriller starring Jim Gaffigan and Robbie Jones. The film was shot in your hometown of Virginia Beach, and you partnered with Old Dominion University and the Virginia Film Office in a workforce initiative to let 25 student interns onto the film. Now, what I find really interesting about this is that you've made a few films at this point, and a lot of film directors, the last thing they want is probably students hanging around a film set. But I found that really interesting that you had allowed 25 local student interns come onto your project with that film, eager to learn as much as possible. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, what I wanted to do was try to offer them some real world experience in the same way that I was I was given those those kind of chances to and, and even whether you know, whether you're pulling cable or pouring coffee at that point, you're on set and you're watching how real production works. And, and you know, you you can figure out whether it's something that you can fit into or whether it's something you want to fit into or not. And so I wanted to offer that opportunity to these students that are in this film program. And I wanted to shoot here at home where I could ask for forgiveness for a lot of things rather than having to ask for permission, like blowing up a car at a baseball field and things like that. I, you know, I knew I could get away with a lot here. You know, a lot of them have gone on to work on other films and some are on their probably fourth or fifth, sixth film at this point. And one of them came down uh, and worked on Unhinged with me after working on American Dreamer and others have gone on to grad school for film. So I think it was a success in terms of, of the the number out of that 25 that have really continued on and are making progress in the industry. That was a it was worth it to have the extra questions and occasionally people, you know, standing in a shot, not knowing that they were blo they were busting the shot for us. But, you know, they learned pretty quickly. I really feel creatively very satisfied with the film. I think Jim is amazing in it. I think his dark turn that no one has ever seen, you know, from him it shows him in a whole new light. His performance, I think, is amazing. Robbie is great. You know, it's a film that I'm really proud of, especially because we, we made it in 16 days with no money and a bunch of students helping out. Well, congratulations. You know, I tip my hat off to you. Much respect for bringing those students in, giving back. And, you know, that's something that money can't buy. The fact that you've got some of those relationships with those students and they've gone on to bigger and better things, really well done. Now, that sort of segues us into a bit of road rage, which I feel like I, I need to get out of my system, having seen your, <laughs> your, your latest film. Road Rage, we've all seen it. Uh, everyone has some sort of experience with Road Rage. Uh, road Rage doesn't discriminate, and, and the film makes you more hyper-aware and conscious of it. It does have a, a, a universal theme that people can certainly relate to. Now, I, I want first question I want to ask you, a lot of producers won't entertain the idea of Russell Crowe being cast in a film because... Many producers say that he's too disruptive. How, firstly, did you cast him? 
And were there concerns from the producers at the beginning of getting him on board into the project of Unhinged? Um, well, let's see. First of all, I guess as far as casting, after reading the script, he was at the top of the list. You know, Russell read the script and, and, and agreed to meet with me. We had a good meeting and I left that meeting really not knowing what was going to happen, whether he was going to do it or not. And then he watched American Dreamer that night and gave me a call the next day. And he, he just really loved the movie and, and the performances and, and wanted to talk a lot about that film. And then he signed on to do the movie. It's not really that interesting of a casting story, I guess you could say, because, uh, you know, we had a meeting, he watched a movie of mine, and, and, and next thing you know, we're working together. But as far as the producers and, and you know, what, whatever kind of reputation you were referring to, you know, Russell and I from day one just connected. And if he asked me a question and I didn't know the answer to it, I tried very hard to avoid just making something up to try to seem like I knew what I was talking about. I would just say, I don't know, let's figure it out. That just, I think, spoke to him in that that I was in the trenches with him and, and I did not know the answer to everything, but I was willing to get dirty and kind of try to find the answers with him. And I think as a result, we really uh, connected on the film and, and have become friends and hoping to work together again. And, and whatever whatever that reputation is, I didn't see any of that. I mean, I saw a guy that showed up to work and delivered a commanding performance and who also knows what every single person on set should be doing or, or and is doing probably better than than all of them sometimes including myself i mean the, he just he's a wealth of knowledge when it comes to film production and that's just kind of the way it was it was roll up your sleeves dur in, in in new orleans during hurricane season trying to shoot an outdoor you know road movie and we all knew what we had to do and we kept focused and, and were able to do it so from a green light perspective, once you got Crow on board, how quickly did that turn into a green light and everything sort of just clicking into place? Mark Gill over at Solstice calls this production Shinkansen or the bullet train because of the speed of how fast this thing came together. I mean, I think they bought the script one day, sent it to me the next day. I was on within a day or two after that. Then we offered it to Russell and he was on. And the next thing you know, we're in New Orleans prepping within, you know, within a week and, and shooting. And then, you know, because of COVID, we rushed our delivery to get to the window that we decided on for the release. I, I want to say, I don't know, 10 or 12 weeks earlier than it, than, than it was supposed to be released. So everything was on a very different timeline than, than anyone was used to. That's for sure. Very fast. So tell me, from the time that you were signed on, did you say you were one week later prepping in New Orleans? Well, from the time I was signed on, I think Russell was probably on within a week. And then I think literally the next day I was on a plane to New Orleans to start scouting. And how quickly was camera turning over from the time that you were doing your scouting? I don't remember exactly, but I know that we got pushed by one week because a hurricane hit New Orleans. Been six weeks of prep or something, but it, I mean, it was short. It was it was definitely not what anyone would have liked to have had, but but at the same time, it worked. So I, I guess that's really all you can ask for. So just give us a sense of the production. Like, how many people were on this production, and how many shoot days did you have to complete? How many people? Good question. I mean, I would say most likely 160, maybe 150 on any given day. We had a lot of extras in cars. I mean, you know, all those cars you see are have drivers in them and some of them are stunt drivers and some of them are just background drivers. But, you know, there were definitely over 100 people every day. What was your second question? I forgot. How many shoot days? Oh, how many shoot days? I want to say it was 35. And we went there thinking we were, I think we had 42 and then it turned into somehow it ended up being like 35 days or something. So Crow, getting to his performance, very nuanced. I've never seen Crow act in this way. None of us have. He's able to turn the screws tighter and tighter. And the whole rhythm of the performance, the way that he looks, the way that he talks, the way that he walks, it is something quite different. Obviously, this is what attracted Crow because he thought he could get into this character and really bring it to life. How do you work with somebody like a crow who's got such a body of work behind him and you're working with an Academy Award winner to try and offer your input? Because clearly crow has his style, his way of doing things. Did he take the direction from you? 
the great thing about working with any actor on that level, you know, my job is to, to paint the picture of, of the backstory and illuminate the things that are going on prior to a film starting or, or prior to a scene. Then the actor is going to take it from there, you know, and I mean, obviously I can massage a performance, but really it's just about helping them find this character, find with this particular character. You know, it was Russell and I spent countless days talking about how this character had gotten to the point where he felt invisible he had been dehumanized and he he no longer had any voice in any way so that he he felt like his only choice was violence talking that through and talking about how that happens to people you know whether they you know do what he does with his vehicle or whether they go into a you know shopping mall and, and with a gun and you know take out their frustrations that way i mean it's something that happens in the real world it's easy to say, oh, this guy's insane or something. This guy's crazy. But really, you know, it seems like if you look at these kind of incidents, something is happening with someone and not by no means want to justify this kind of behavior. But at the same time, you need to talk about what would get someone to that point where they feel like they literally have no other choice but to express themselves in some violent way. I think in doing that with Russell, that informed who he was or who this character was and 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 gave Russell a way to a path into the character. I mean, the other thing we talked about a lot was I early on, I told him that I felt like this character was almost like the shark in Jaws. And Russell latched onto that as well. And it's funny, you know, he would, one time he came up to me and said, you know, I really love this idea that this character is the shark in Jaws. But I got to tell you, that shark didn't talk this much. <laughs> yeah. But I guess, you know, to answer your question, my job was to just kind of help talk it out, figure out where this guy came from, what what got him to this point and why people snap like this. You know, and I think that that applies to any character. What feels real and grounded and is a playable action for an actor in some way that isn't just taking the direction that, hey, this guy's crazy. So just go do this. You know, you, it, that just doesn't work. Digging in deeper and, and analyzing with every character in every film, I think, is important. You know, I talk about the nuanced performance of Crow. It's a film that would be best shot in sequential order, which it probably wasn't. But when you've got an actor like a Crow, he's never going to get lost at any point of what you're shooting. Can you remember the first day of shooting what you were shooting and that whole revelation with when you see him on camera bringing this character to life? I think I always have that experience where you've been prepping something, you've been working with an actor, you've been reading the script over and over and over again. And when you finally see an actor bring that character and that scene to life, that really, to me, is the most rewarding part of the entire process is when you see it for the first time or you see a certain scene brought to life by an actor the first time. I saw it with Russell throughout this film. I saw it with Gaffigan so much in American Dreamer that, you know, I mean, it was almost like he was channeling Philip Seymour Hoffman or something in this film and, and just, you know, showing a side of himself that no one had ever seen. And I think that's a special thing to be back you know, at that monitor. All of this, everything that's led to this point is being captured right now. This is the magical moment when, when that performance is happening right there in front of you. And that's really what the, I think the most special part of this process is. But you know what I mean when I say jumping around a script with a film like this, shooting out of order, a lesser actor sometimes can get very lost in terms of what that character arc is and where that oh, arc sure. should be. Crow did yeah. that really brilliantly because it is shot out of order and yeah. he never got lost. You know, he, he always knew where he was in the script and it just all sort of rhythmically played to the tune of, you know, what the bigger idea, the bigger picture was. Absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, we'd all love to shoot sequentially. And unfortunately, the, the reality of production doesn't really allow it most of the time. But but you're right. I mean, I think that the idea is that you, if you're not shooting sequentially, you want to make it feel like it was shot sequentially because that's the way it's being viewed. And, you know, part of my job, I feel like, is to always remind the actors kind of where we just came from and where we are in the scene. And, you know, I think when you're coming in with six or seven pages of dialogue every day, day after day, be made aware a little bit extra of where we are in the arc of the story of their character. And yeah, he is really amazing at not getting lost. You're right. But it's always great when it works out that way that appears sequential and seamless. 
The restaurant scene, got to ask you about that because that was such a great scene, the way it, it all played out. Did you have much time to shoot that? Uh, I had two days to shoot it, which was which was great. The way the restaurant was set up, we really had to kind of shoot everything from one side one day and everything from the other side the next day. That to me was my, you know, it's funny when you think about it, I got a five page scene with two people, you know, seated across from each other in a restaurant. How do you make that work? And when you have two actors like Russell and Jimmy Simpson, you know, it's like, oh, okay, I I have the right actors. It's going to work out fine because they both have such, you know, commanding presence on camera and are really just such, you know, great actors that once we got them in the room together and they started, you know, playing off each other, it really, there's such a cat and mouse game going on in that scene. And the two actors really, look, I would love to take credit for the scene. When you've got those two sitting in the in the booth there in front of you, it, it makes my job very easy. And Jimmy, like you say, Jimmy did a fantastic job. He has got that real sort of screen presence about him, and it just did elevate. It, it, it went to a different level. Now, did you shoot on two cameras? We always had multiple cameras running. That day, I want to say those two days, we may have had three cameras running. One thing that happened in New Orleans was we were shooting during hurricane season and you have these lightning delays where if lightning strikes within an eight mile radius or what, I think it's eight miles, you have to shut down the production for a half an hour. And when I say shut down the production, I mean literally shut down the production. You can't shoot, you can't do anything. And then if any time during that half an hour, there's another lightning strike, that half an hour extends another half an hour. So Hmm. essentially we were losing two or three hours a day because of lightning. And, you know, during, I mean, it was a hundred. 105, 110 degrees there. So you get these thunderstorms every afternoon. So knowing that instead of shooting our normal 12 hour day, we were shooting essentially, you know, nine hour days, 10 hour days if we're lucky. I just knew that unless I had extra cameras rolling, I was never going to make my day. So I had less takes with the actors, but I had more cameras running at all times because it was really the only way to make the day. And what about test screening this film? It, it, it appears to me that this is something you definitely want to get into the cinema to get it tested in front of an audience just to see where the rhythm, the cut has landed. Did you do that? We did. Thankfully, you know, just before COVID really, you know, caused LA to go on lockdown, when it was still normal for people to be going out to the to the theaters, we were able to do a test screening, I think, with three or 400 people in it. And it played exactly the way that that I felt like I, it was going to because the collective tension in the room was, I'd seen the movie a hundred times by that point, but I could feel it, you know, just coursing through me. You know, it really was uh, meant to be seen on a big screen. I mean, thankfully, we were able to get into so many drive-ins during the, the release because I always felt like this felt like a drive-in movie to me, you know, really felt like <laughs> yeah. one of those, I don't know, just like a, dri- a movie I would have been taken to see as a kid. My parents may have thought that I fell asleep in the back of the car. Those kind of brutal, adrenaline-fueled drive-in movies of the 70s or something, it just felt like that to me. And it, it did really well at the drive-ins, and, and it did well theatrically. I think seeing it in a big room full of people, when you see it on a big screen, it really does make all the difference in the world. How did you test the film? Because you would have wanted to know some key questions. Did you ask uh, questions in a Q&A or did they get a bit of a survey with a bunch of questions on it? How did that sort of play out for you? Well, the studios just hire, you know, they, they hire these companies that, that specialize in it where they, you know, part survey, part question and answer. And then they do these 100 page comprehensive reports on those surveys and, you know, try to quantify everything. So were you and Mark Gill surprised at some of the the meta rating that came through off that test audience screening? I mean, I don't know that we were surprised. I think we we were in the room when the screening happened. So we heard the screams. We could feel it and hear it and see the audience and how into the movie they were. So I I don't think that, you know, anything came back as any kind of a surprise. I think it was, uh, you know, we all felt good. I can tell you that. Well, it's definitely a a film to get into the cinema when the cinemas open up, because as you say, it's definitely a film that you want to see on the big screen. But barring that, I did see it on a small screen and it still had an effect on me. Derek, look, it's been really great catching up and talking to you about all of your films. And as you as a director, writer and producer, as a filmmaker, I'm certainly looking forward to seeing what comes next for you. And thank you so much for coming on to Shoot It Now. Thank you so much for having me. I I really appreciate it. 
You've been listening to Shoot It Now with Craig Newland, your weekly podcast about all things behind the camera and in front of it. Until next time, have a great week.